it does feel like if you aren't getting treated the way that you are being treated, I have some skepticism about whether or not you're actually you know, presenting a real challenge to power. The Democratic Party is not home for a real progressive agenda. And as long as you're going to attach yourself to the Democratic Party, expect that this sort of thing is going to happen. Forcing the vote, as it were, is not a one-off to the people who want us to stop talking about it. It's never, it was never about a one-off. It's a political strategy that exposes the gap between what elected officials are willing to do and fight for and what the people that elected them want. If you are not facing absolute hostility from the ruling class and their political representatives, then you're not doing what needs to be done for the working class. I'm thrilled as always to have with me today Shama Sawant, Seattle City Councilwoman uh, and the first socialist elected to city council in many, many, many decades. But now, uh, not the only self-identified socialist to come on the scene in a big way and also have big pushback from uh, centrist uh, corporate Democrats. So welcome today, Shama. Thank you so much for having me. So last time you were on, we talked about this recall effort um, to recall your duly won election campaign. Can you catch us up on where we are right now? Yes, the last time we were talking about it, we uh, I believe we were talking about the recall campaign, collecting signatures, petition signatures to get on the ballot. Since then, very recently, they have gotten their signatures on the ballot and the election date, the recall election date is set for December 7th. And I think the, the date is not a logistical occurrence by any means. I think it's really important for all of your audience, national and international, to understand that from the very beginning, from its very inception, this is extremely political in nature. And the fact that they dodged the regular November election when you have mayoral and city council candidates and other important ballot initiatives on the ballot, they have chosen a, uh, an election which falls between Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays itself is uh, just, uh, just reeks of their um, opposition to having a democratic election. And not only have, uh, not only is this recall an attempt to have a do-over of, as you said, the democratic election that we won in 2019, uh, it's, um, it's incredible to see how every institution under capitalism has colluded to make this December 7th election happen, including the Washington State Supreme Court, which with no explanation at all, sat on the ruling for whether they should go on the ballot or not for over three months, essentially opening the door for the recall campaign to have this uh, election that is going to be favorable, election date that is going to fav be favorable for wealthy people and predominantly white and wealthy people, uh, whereas renters, ordinary people, working people, communities of color are less likely to vote in these unusual elections. So that means that the challenge for us to get out the vote is that much more immense. So the argument here is the argument that we've seen recently in some some other elections across the country where if you have a an election date where there are a lot of things on the ballot, a lot of reasons for people to turn out, and during a kind of typically held election time, you're more likely to see more working class voters, lower income voters um, turn out, whereas if you have these kind of sporadic um, non-traditional election dates where there's only one thing on the ballot, it tends to inert to the benefit of the status quo. That's the argument? Uh, absolutely. And, and, that, that, and that is based very much on overwhelming statistical evidence. You know, First of all, just to note, uh, you know, before coming to the statistics that we have from national studies, uh, just in Seattle, in, this will be a District 3 race just like our 2019 District 3 election that we won, which, were, by the way, was our third election and our second re-election hmm. that we were able to win despite just unprecedented pushback from big business, the Chamber of Commerce, and from the right wing in Seattle. So what we see in District 3 is increasingly what we are seeing in metropolitan areas where the electorate is very polarized. You know, you have working people, people who are very concerned about social and economic justice, people who are, you know, who are, who've been part of the new emerging social movements and also the changes in the labor movement that are starting to happen, and renters on the one hand, and uh, very well-off wealthy people also tend, sometimes tend to be older, uh, you see a real divide. So if you look at the statistics from our past elections, the vote that we get among renters and working people is overwhelmingly high. And then when you go to what we 
colloquially called the Gold Coast, which is all the wealthy homes on the Lake Washington front, uh, you'll see uh, much higher rates of uh, support for big, the big business candidates who have run against us. So already we see that divide. Uh, but when you look at national statistics in terms of when elections are held, to your point, Brianna, you know, in terms of whether it's elections that have many other things on the ballot that will draw out more voters, the numbers are pretty stark. I mean, uh, national statistics show that uh, even uh, between renters and homeowners, the difference can be even up to 50 percent. Hmm. So this is a really big question we are talking about. And it is important to note that, yes, Seattle is progressive compared to many Republican-dominated states. That's true, but that's because ordinary people are progressive. But when mm. you look at the role of the establishment, you see, despite the differences between the Republicans and especially the very right-wing re Republican and the Democrats, of course, there are differences. But when you see how they push back against working-class efforts, working-class candidates, or, you know, or the labor movement, you know, unionization efforts and so on. You'll see these common threads between the two parties. So what's happening uh, with the recall election against us is very similar to the ongoing right-wing efforts at voter suppression in many other states which are more right-wing dominated. Hmm. So, so help me understand what the campaign against you looks like on the ground. Because to your point about... Um, the kind of renter homeowner divide. Uh, we recently had India Walton on the podcast, um, who won her primary, Democratic primary for mayor of Buffalo, but is seeing similar types of opposition. She notably won overwhelmingly with renters, and some of the um, campaign against her now is seemingly targeting homeowners talking about her raising property taxes and stuff like that. And um, we saw in Senator Turner's race, there was an effort to actually run to her left. So much uh, to, uh, contrary to the idea that leftists can't win in the Midwest, it was her more um, conservative opponent who was trying to use the fact that she voted against the Democratic Party agenda because it wasn't progressive enough to paint her as someone who was against a popular program like the $15 minimum wage. What does the argument against you on the ground look like? Well, the argument from the recall campaign itself, which is very uh, dominated by big business interests, corporate interests, especially corporate landlords who are livid at the incredible success we've had in winning renters' rights victories. In fact, just uh, days ago, on Monday last week, we won some critical renters' rights. In the middle of, you know, in the middle of a recall campaign against us, we have been able to, through our office and organizing renters, we have now won two major laws um, uh, requiring landlords to give at least a six-month notice before any rent increase and requiring landlords, if they raise uh, rents, you know, in the absence of rent control, if they raise rents more than 10% 10 per 10 or more, then and that, that forces their tenant to move, then the landlords owe the tenants three months' rent. Wow. This, these are major victories, and we were able to win despite the fact that the, um, you know, the eight Democrats on the council, they're not on our side. They're not mm. on the side of uh, renters, but they're forced to vote yes on these progressive issues because of how well we have been able to organize alongside renters and union members. And in fact, many progressive unions have been part of this effort alongside Socialist Alternative and my office. So it's no surprise that corporate landlords are angry. And it's not only that they would love to reverse the victories that we've already won. We, they know that if we stay in office, we are absolutely going to push for and win rent control. And we have already started a campaign. In fact, November 30th, just days before the recall election, the Renters Rights Committee that I chair on the council is going to have a big discussion on our rent control legislation that my office has drafted. So it's clear where the battle lines are drawn. Uh, and of course, Amazon uh, S-team executives are also part of this. So it's in general, it's big business interests that are aligned um, uh, for the recall and in, in, in order to remove us from office. And I say us because it's not individually directed at me. It's directed at what we've been able to achieve through this fighting approach that we've used as a Marxist elected office. But what it looks like on the ground is completely different in the sense that they're not there out there speaking the truth, saying... Yeah, I hate Shama Sawant because she has fought for renters and won victories, and I want to reverse those gains. I want the city to work only for real rich people. That's not what they're going around saying. Right. What they have brought are trumped-up charges, uh, completely dishonest, 
and the, well, their their statement in the ballot on the ballot uh, you know in, in the ballot pamphlet is going to imply that somehow we did some engage in some wrongdoing and our response to that of course makes it very clear that i have broken no law no court has ever find found me to have done uh, something to have broken the law but in fact that these are charges that are uh, both dishonest and also they are charges that actually if you read them carefully are an attack very clearly against the black lives matter protest movement because you know one of the charges is about uh uh blm protesters coming alongside me to city hall uh and uh, on the face of it it uh, purports to be a concern about covid but let me tell you something the same state supreme court that approved the recall against me threw out the recall charges on a covid denying sheriff named john snaza from a local county who refused to enforce the mask mandate on his officers so just just to clarify and for people who don't remember um when we talked about this the last time you were on uh during the covid the, sorry the george floyd protests last summer there was a march to city hall you marched with BLM members to City Hall and the charge against you is that you created a COVID risk in doing so and somehow in, in violation of your, you know, your role as a city council person? Yes, yeah, something like that. But what they're, what, what, what they're hoping to do to fool people is uh, into believing that, well, I, I like what she's fought for. I, you know, I stand with her on $15 an hour, the Amazon tax and renter's rights. But if she broke the law, I have to draw the line there. That's where mm. the confusion they want to create. So we need to be crystal clear. And that's why I'm trying to be crystal clear here. We have broken no law. Mm. No court has ever found me guilty of any charges. And so what we need to do is to explain beyond that. So why are they implying? Why are they fudging the facts in order to imply that I've broken the law? Well, because they don't want to talk about the real reasons why they want me recalled. So what does the ballot look like? Is this a case like in um, the recent California effort where the options are, you know, kind of up, down on Newsom and then it's it's off to the races with the second party, uh, with the second um, ballot line candidate? You know, what are people being asked to decide between when they look at the ballot uh, in December? So when they look at the ballot, there's no other candidate in um, in any um, that, that that's not the question. The question is a straight up: Do you want to recall Shama Sawant or do you not want to recall? Are you, are you opposed to the recall? So recall yes, recall no. That's the only way the ballot is going to look like, and that is why it is going to be. Uh, you know that that is what the ruling class and the recall campaign are relying on. That. Uh, people won't be uh, clear about what the recall is actually about. Uh, and that's why our job is you know, that much more challenging because we have to explain that the charges are dishonest and then also explain what the charges actually represent. You know, what is, what is this recall actually about? And so the ballot synopsis will have the, their three uh, that we, we believe to be dishonest charges uh, against me. And then our response will be why people should vote no against the recall. And in our in our response, of course, we say that the charges against Shama Sawant are dishonest and the courts haven't found her guilty of anything. Shama, an immigrant woman of color, is being attacked for participating in peaceful Black Lives Matter protests. This recall is part of the racist right wing backlash attempting to criminalize protests nationally. Big business and the right wing want to remove Shama because she is an effective, she's such an effective fighter for working people. Rather than appeasing the establishment, Shama has used her eight years in office to win historic victories like the $15 minimum wage and the Amazon tax. And, you know, there's there's more to it about what the, the recall being bankrolled by the corporate elite. So this is our response to their dishonest charges. For example, that I uh, use city resources to support a ballot initiative. I disregarded state orders related to COVID. And also, let, let, supposedly, let a protest march. Uh, if you don't mind, I, maybe I should. It also makes sense to clarify the other two things. I mean, we talked about sure. going to city hall, which sure. is one of the charges. The other charge that they're using is that I use city resources to support a ballot initiative and fail to comply with the public disclosure requirements related to such support. Well, let's look at what the facts are. 
uh, we when 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 my office was fighting for the tax, this is related to the tax Amazon movement. And as part of the movement, yes, there was a ballot initiative which was never filed, but that was a very crucial part of the strategy. It was a very crucial tactic in our strategy to put pressure on the Democrats and on big business to pass this by the council. And indeed, it, we heard from big business directly that if it wasn't for the threat of a credible ballot initiative with massive support from ordinary people, they would not have, the Democrats would not have passed the Amazon tax on the council. But uh, so, so it's it's not that they're, the recall is lying that there was a ballot initiative, but what they are doing is creating massive confusion on what this actually was. So in my view, at the time we were following the ethics rules as, as to our best to, to our best knowledge, uh, the ethics commission, which is not the court, you know, this mm. is this is where the, they are trying to create confusion. Also, there are ethics rules for elected officials and people in, you know, people related to public office for public employees, public sector employees. Uh, and then there's the law and the courts uphold those laws uh, or are supposed to uphold those laws. Uh, and these, this question is nothing to do with the law. It is related to ethics rules. And in our view, we were following the ethics rules to a T, but uh, according to the ethics commission, we didn't. And so we paid a fine. Mm. By that measure, there are other council members, many Democrats who have actually in more, they're, they're more clearly violated the ethics rules. They've paid a fine. None of them faced a recall charge. So in other words, this is not a recallable charge. Even if you believe that we did something wrong, it is not a recallable offense by any means. That is why it's important to explain that this is not what it's about. They're using this, but that's not what this is about. Same with uh, the third charge, you know, letter protest march. And in fact, this is the, one of the most blatant charges uh, of, of all the three. They say, uh, I led a protest march to Mayor Jenny Durkin's private residence, the location of which Council Member Sawant knew was protected again under state confidentiality laws. First of all, I did not lead that march. Mm. Everybody knows that I did not lead this march. Mm. The leaders of the march have said publicly that I did not lead the march. They did. They invited me to speak. And you know who led the march? It was families. It was uh, black and indigenous families of people who have been killed at the hands of the police. Mm. These are people demanding police accountability. These are people who are angry that none of the police officers who were responsible for the killings of their family members have been brought to justice. They organized the march. They decided the route of the march. They invited me to speak, which I was honored to do. I would do that a thousand times over because that's the right and principal thing to do. But I did not, in fact, lead the march. Well, Shama, that brings to mind, you know, the current fracas that's happening in D.C. right now, where much of the news cycle over the last few days has been devoted to coverage of the ethics of some young protesters following Kirsten Cinema into a bathroom to ask questions of her. She was also confronted on an airplane, uh, an act which got less negative coverage than the the people who followed her into the bathroom. What do you make of the media response to these incidents? Because it does feel like there is kind of a selective outrage going on um, with respect to the how people perceive the appropriateness of confronting politicians in various contexts. It, absolutely. It is not only selective outrage, it's actually very politically instigated, you know, where they express the outrage and where the same uh, kind of behavior is condoned. That is very much politically motivated and really is an example of the example that you gave of Christian cinema and then, you know, compare that to the recall effort against us. All of this shows you that in a system that is fundamentally deeply unequal. It's not somewhat unequal. It is deeply disproportionate. And what is disproportionate, obviously, is the wealth uh, disparities. But with those wealth disparities come tremendous uh, imbalance of political power. And so what gets written in the media, what gets deemed as heroic behavior, and what gets deemed as something that needs to be chastised or something that needs to be castigated, all of that is determined. It's not none of that is incidental. All and it's not a conspiracy theory. It's merely a, an outcome of the deep imbalance of political and economic power. So these decisions and, and what gets constituted as, as a good behavior versus bad behavior is very much 
the, uh, uh, an outcome of that imbalance of power. And so it really is a reminder for us that the rules, you know, the, the rules and the laws of the land are actually made by the ruling class of any given time in class society. In, in, you know, and they decide what the rules should be. They will decide how the rules will get enforced. I wonder, to that point, how closely you've been following uh, the India Walton Mishigas in, in, in Buffalo. You know, she obviously won her primary. The incumbent that she beat attempted first to um, start a new party, the Buffalo Party, and get on the ballot that way. And when that failed, um, decided to just ha- launch a write-in campaign. Um, and... Uh, India on the show uh, last week described him as basically a Republican. Um, and yet, despite the conservative nature of her opponent and the conservative nature of the literal Republican and non-identifying other member of the race who used to be a Democrat but won't come out as Republican is doing a little bit of fence sitting, that there's still not the full support of the Democratic Party and Buffalo behind her. And it seems like this is another one of those instances that's really revealing the extent to which um, it's not a left-right dynamic. It's a top-down dynamic. And um, anybody to the left of the Democratic Party is less suitable in the eyes of the establishment to lead um, than an actual conservative. I wonder, have you had any conversations with India or uh, dialogues at all about what's going on in your respective races? Uh, I'm really glad you asked this question. I have personally not had the pleasure of talking to India Walton, but Socialist Alternative in New York City. Uh, in fact, specifically, my fellow member in uh, Socialist Alternative in New York, Algier Hawkins, has been in touch with India Walton. In fact, as we speak, I believe uh, we are trying to arrange for a time for her and me to talk, which I really, really mm. look forward to. But I think, uh, again, from the very beginning, the way the Democratic establishment has responded to India Walton's race, I mean, India Walton's campaign, sorry, uh, is again emblematic of where they actually stand. I mean, it's very, the democratic establishment and, and and the progressive wing of the democratic establishment does the more conservative wing of the establishment a favor here by putting forward a pr- performatively progressive kind of um, approach. Uh, but then when there is any real uh, sense of, okay, this is somebody who has come from the grassroots and will, whether they themselves are going to uphold it or not, going to face serious pressure because of the expectations attached to them from the people who are supporting them, which are ordinary people, then immediately you see all the, all the, um, uh, the, the, the establishment calling all the stops, pulling all the stops to prevent that candidate from achieving success. Um, and I think that's what you see in the India Walton uh, race. What, that's what you saw with Nina Turner. And I think uh, it really, I I would just say that at the end of the day, what this proves is precisely what uh, we in Socialist Alternative have been saying is that the Democratic Party is not home for a real progressive agenda. And as long as you're going to attach yourself to the Democratic Party, expect that this sort of thing is going to happen. And that's why we argue that working people need a party of our own. I'm curious if you caught any of the news about Andrew Yang starting a third party and what you make of that effort? Uh, I have to be honest, I haven't followed that very closely, but uh, I don't believe for a moment that it is a genuine effort that will um, put forward a working class agenda. I mean, from everything that we know about him, that, that, that how, how can you expect that that is going to happen? However, I don't think we should make the mistake of sort of poo-pooing it uh, as, a, as, a, as something that, oh, that's on the fringe or whatever. What it what it does show it's an example. I mean, how far it goes, it depends. It, that depends on you know many political factors. But what it does show is that when there is real anger among working people, you know, ordinary people who are traditionally the Democratic Party base, and the party wants to uh, push aside any real effort at a working class agenda. Look at this. You know, here we are in October and fifteen dollars an hour Medicare for all. And let alone all of that, the infrastructure bill, the social spending bill, everything is in crisis right now. It shows you what their real politics are. But then in that midst, in the midst of the real anger and demoralization and disappointment, you will see these kind of technocratic. I mean, I I call Yang's uh, approach a technocratic approach, which has uh, some pretense to being lefty or, you know, representing 
the anger of ordinary people, but in reality, we'll channel it back to the same place. Mm. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get him on the podcast soon and ask him some um, pointed questions about uh, what the goals are and, and uh, how he hopes to achieve them. But I want to come back to this question about what's going on in the Hill right now, because one might argue that the fact that a certain amount of resistance is being countenanced right now, is seemingly allowed right now, is evidence that the threat isn't at the level that you have posed in Seattle in a way that has resulted in a recall campaign against you. The threat isn't what Indian Walton is perceived to be bringing to the table in, in Buffalo. Um, and you, you used the word performative before. There are some on the left who feel so burned over the lack of action, whether it was over force of vote or the $15 minimum wage, who are skeptical about what is being um, fought for here or how much they should invest in it. I believe earlier today on a call, Biden told progressives the target would be around $2 trillion. There has been a very open willingness to negotiate down despite the fact that the um, conservatives who are holding up the human infrastructure bill haven't actually articulated a number or a desire for certain programs to be cut. And it does feel as though holding the line might be holding the line for a human infrastructure bill that is far beneath the needs of climate and the human needs of a community that's just still reeling from an economic and healthcare pandemic. And that it could be that a victory is claimed by progressives for holding the line and having two bills go through, no matter how neutered the human infrastructure bill is. What do you make of the dance that's going on right now on the Hill? That's a, a very important question. I mean, first of all, I would just say that just, and you started your question with this point, which I wanted to just uh, reiterate, which is that the, f the fact that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party on the Hill, you know, uh, the squad and the others who are in the progressive caucus, the fact that they're going this far, even uh, compared to what their positions were on force the vote and fifteen dollars an hour, which uh, you know we've talked about this before on your show, um, but we completely disagreed with. Uh, we it, it 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 is a positive thing in the sense that it shows the pressure they are under mm. because they know that their base is getting demoralized. There is consternation at the very least among. Uh, many AOC supporters thinking, well, wait a second, what, what is what is it that we are, you know, what, what what expectations did we have in terms of the fight that the squad would put up with and what are they actually doing? So in that sense, I would, I, I welcome this fight that they're putting up because it shows the pressure they are under from ordinary people. However, I think you are absolutely correct to point out the dangers in, again, doing this in sort of, a, it's in terms of half measures where, uh, if you contrast what they are doing now to what we have, uh, Socialist Alternative and I had argued from the very fir first moments of the force the vote debate, what we what we said, and and you know people who are listening to this can go back to the articles I personally wrote on Socialist Alternative website, where we said that it's not merely about taking the correct position on uh, on the congressional floor. Absolutely, that is a starting point because if you don't do that, then what principles do you have? So, uh, yes, it is important that the squad use its numerical balance of power to push for the right things, but that we don't believe that merely taking a moralistic stand in Congress is going to be enough because ultimately the forces that control Congress are absolutely entrenched and they are absolutely corporate. And so if you want to give a real battle to those corporate forces, that is not going to be enough. That is absolutely the correct starting point. And if you don't even do that, then it's abysmal. But if you do that, that's not going to be enough. You have to then turn around and call for mass rallies and mobilize people and really urge the leaders of the labor movement to also mobilize ordinary you know, union members, rank and file, into mass action. And that is what will be the beginning of real pressure on the corporate forces in Congress, both in the Democratic and Republican Party. And I think you're also right to warn that we, you know, we, I mean, we, I mean, I have my differences with, with the squad, but, uh, but it's also important to point out that we don't want the progressive Congress members to, to be doing it in such a half measure kind of effort where they are left giving cover to 
a very, very weakened and watered down bill, which people will understand is very weakened and watered down and give cover to that corporate agenda. And the, then the idea of holding the line itself becomes discredited because then you get blamed as progressives for simply holding the line, but not actually achieving what ordinary people want. And that's why we have to be very, very clear that uh, hold it, uh, that using your elected office in a way that's actually effective matters. And you do that when you understand that it's not about you, it's about mobilizing the masses. And until you have elected representatives who understand that, it's really going to be uh, it's going to be a problematic situation. And we also have to remember this is a very, very crucial time for, for the Democratic Party uh, because this could have serious implications for what happens in the midterm elections. Why is it that you think squad members don't mobilize folks in the way that you've described, aren't presumably, um, from what we can tell, reaching out to labor to rally in the way that you've described. These are people who have an enormous amount of social media outlets, enormous email lists, and not just including the squad, people like Bernie Sanders, who obviously had an enormous amount of reach as a, a carryover from his presidential campaign, his two presidential campaigns. I think that uh, it's... Uh regardless of intentions and i've said this on your show before i don't i don't, I don't i'm not a mind reader so i mm -hmm. uh, let's assume that the many of the individuals have best intentions i think uh you can be an elected representative progressive elected representative with uh, and, and very well intentioned and yet not want to actually pose a serious enough challenge to the corporate forces because it is very very uh it's very hard to do it i'm not saying that to give them an excuse, but I'm saying that to explain that in order to be able to do that, you know, actually call mass rallies, you have to be willing to truly, truly accept the, you know, the the gauntlet that's been thrown to you, which and is what, that you what are is going the to gauntlet? Yeah. Well, what 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 are the consequences? Is, the the consequences are, uh, you is what you're seeing right now in Seattle. The consequences are that they will stop at nothing. Right now, they are trying to recall me a three times elected uh, representative, even though they were not able to win in 2019. But that's not the only consequence. I believe, I mean, you know, I, I and I can say this because I've had uh, nearly eight years of uh, direct experience of what it looks like to be a genuine Marxist elected representative who is making no bones about which side I am on. What that means, Brianna, is that your daily life becomes a battleground. And a lot of the times, in fact, virtually all of the time, because I, unfortunately for us, I think our office is that rare example of a genuine fight back where not only have we refused to sell out, but we have also refused to be marginalized and we have an unprecedented track record on win winning victories, uh, virtually unheard of. It's unfortunate that it's so rare, but that's where it is. But I believe the reason is that when you actually do that, and this is the re this is the answer to your question also, like why aren't they calling for mass rallies? Well, that is when you become a serious enemy of the ruling class. As long as you are uh, making speeches and saying, well, I'm not going to vote on this or that, it, they still don't like you and they will go to war against you as much as they are they possibly can. And I'm not trying to portray that as not requiring courage. However, that is not what actually poses the challenge to big business. It's when you mobilize ordinary people that that happens. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I don't want to define somebody's sincerity only by virtue of the opposition against them. But on some level, it does feel like if you aren't getting treated the way that you are being treated, I have some skepticism about whether or not you're actually you know, presenting a real challenge to power. So this yes. is part of the analysis around the AOC dress business. It's not that, you know, I personally have strong feelings one way or the other about the idea of doing a performative stunt like that at a, a, a ball. But the fact that the response from the Met Gala itself, from the celebrities in question, was positive, right? It, it, it suggests to me that it wasn't, as subversive as it should have been or which would have kind of justified all of the other kind of critiques about why would you want to enter that space? Why would you want to validate these people, et cetera, et cetera, that, that were going on? Yes. 
Yes, I think I think that's very true, Brianna. I mean, you, I, I believe that uh, you can take that as a rule of thumb, that if you are not facing absolute hostility from the ruling class and their political representatives, then you are not pushed. Then you are not doing what needs to be done for the working class. Now I say that with such clarity because there is a temptation among genuine people, and I don't not just it's not just about people who get elected. Ordinary people have this feeling that, 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 that there's this desire to believe that well, you can, you everybody can get along uh, in in you know in in Congress or in City Hall, and yet we can really change society. It doesn't work because that's not how it's set up. That is not how capitalism is set up. You cannot go to the fossil fuel billionaires and nice them into ending the use of fossil fuel and moving to clean energy and provide just, just transition for their workers. You cannot nice them into it. You have to fight them tooth and nail to win anything. We did not win $15 an hour by uh, believing that businesses who oppose that could be won over by us talking to them nicely or that the Democrats who were threatening to vote against it would vote yes because we could because I could be nice to them and, and honestly I think that I am actually nicer to them <laughs> than they are. You should see how uh, they brutalize me often publicly. I know people have seen this but it is not personal. The fact is again to your point the fact that they behave that way to me shows that they are very clear which side I am on, and they t because they represent the interests of the ruling class, they will go to war against me. So it's not personal, it is absolutely politics, but unless you're taking that battle on, you are not doing what needs to be done for the working class. But here again, having an organization with you is extremely important. I would not want your listeners, your viewers, to walk away with from what I'm saying but with a sense of, oh well, so then we need people of very high moral caliber. Yeah, first of all, you do need people of high moral caliber. Let's make no bones about that. Yes, that is true. But this is not um, only about individual characteristics. Our battle is lost before we even fight it if we believe that, oh, then we need messiahs or great individuals. No, that's not what it's about. It's about having your own organization that stands with you tooth and nail, that is organizing actually, not just talking about it, but organizing on the ground. The reason I am able to be so bold is because I have Socialist Alternative with me and I am in by no means alone. And that gives me the, it's not about emotional, it's about political, you know, it, that gives me the political stamina and the strength and the clarity to go forward. And so as long as people are individuals, it is not going to work despite their best intentions. And that's why, you know, the, the, did Bernie Sanders uh, show tremendous courage and uh, did he have a very principled approach to what kind of campaign he ran, you know, in terms of, you know, bringing the working class demands? Absolutely. It takes a lot of courage to do what he did. But it, at the end of the day, what is what are we left with from uh, the, the, the defeats he experienced at the hands of the Democratic establishment and the, in, in the, in the D, DCC, whatever it's called? What, what do we have left over? Compare that to had he built a political organization coming out of his defeat in 2016 rather than providing cover for the Biden administration. That's the difference. Yeah, here's the thing. I, I, I watched the, the Biden administration put out a little promo video about the infrastructure talks, I believe, yesterday. And you see a bunch of senators sitting in the Oval Office and Bernie is among them. And I was struck because, you know, it was the first time I remember seeing an image of Bernie in the Oval like that. It was pro perhaps the most, you know, the highest status <laughs> photo I'd ever seen of him or, or video I've ever, I'd ever seen of him. And I'm, I confess it made me feel some kind of way, like not a positive way. I, I just had this kind of flash of, okay, we were talking about a $6 trillion bill down to $3.5 trillion, and now we're in there and Biden's talking about two and Manchin's throwing out $1.5, even though Manchin a few months ago was talking about four and they're all sitting in this room debating it. And I I want the Bernie that's out in front of the crowd. I like the Bernie that instead of trying to make his case to a room full of people who are paid to want to oppose him, is making the case to people who can sincerely pressure them to do better, um, to do what is needed. And I, I, I don't, I don't know, like I, I have been very, really hesitant to 
kind of be openly critical of individuals who I'm asking basically to display a significant degree of courage. And I'm not, you know, I want to be sensitive to the fact that the demand is high and the risks are high and significant. But at the same time, sometimes I feel like that conversation about what people have, what elected officials, what, you know, political leaders have to put themselves through is overly centered over the harms that are being experienced by millions of people every single day, and we can lose sight of that. And when the rhetoric of what ordinary people are going through is coupled or is deployed by political leaders to motivate certain kinds of actions, and frankly, to motivate compromise, to justify compromise, it becomes really disgusting, I got to be honest. Uh, and the cynicism of that is some, some much, some, uh, in some ways too much to bear. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, I'm done. I was going to maybe play, uh, I want you to, to respond to that if you want, but I was also going to maybe play this clip of AOC doing um, the cable news shows and showing where how she sounds and the rhetoric that she's using right now around this, this infrastructure debate. Yes, we should be holding elected representatives to high standards, and, and I also want to be clear, we are not, at least I am not, when I think of, uh, you know, le holding leaders accountable and holding them to high standards, I'm not just talking about Congress members or city mm. council members, something like that. We're also talking about elected officers in the labor movement. Mm. We're talking about unelected, but clearly people who are paying, playing a leadership role in social movements, like in mm. the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. Well, oh. I, that, that labor point, I think, is important because part of why I asked that question wasn't just to be like, you know, the the progressives aren't doing what they need to be doing. But there is some question as to whether or not labor would deploy if asked at all, given the capture that exists at the head of a lot of these kinds of uh, institutions. Oh, yeah. And in fact, the I would say the labor leaders have been missing in action right now. I mean, why aren't they mobilizing uh, the, you know, hundreds of thousands of union members, if not millions, around the nation in order to uh, push for the maximum possible potential and, you know, really put pressure on uh, uh, Biden, Christian Cinema, and on Joe Manchin. Uh, and I think uh, you, you have to, uh, uh, alongside calling out the deficiencies in what the progressive con Congress members have done, we also have to point out the deficiencies of the labor leaders as well. And, you know, they're, they're sort of the progressive leaders in every realm are sort of busy giving each other cover. And then, uh, and then you know, basically uh, it is presented in a personalized uh, standpoint that, well, it's very hard to do. You know, you, you can't hold them to such high standards because you've not, never done it. You don't know what kind of hell it is. Well, that's, we cannot accept that. We cannot accept that for precisely the reason you said, because... Yes, that is what you are called upon to do. That is what history requires us to do. We are facing an existential crisis uh, as, far, as far as the human race is concerned. We are talking about tens of millions of Americans in the richest country in the world facing untold misery of different kinds, uh, only compounded by the pandemic, by the economic uh, crisis that they experienced. So yes, should we be holding elected leaders to high standards? Absolutely. Do they have an obligation? Absolutely. And I don't want to hear uh, about, oh, well, you know, well, we can't expect everyone to be like you, Shama. You know, this is what we, I, I hear from people. And, and that is why we have to really push back against personality oriented politics. It should not be seen as, oh, some rare person can do it. No, what we need are political organizations uh, like a working class party that will be accountable to us where the party, by the power of its membership, by the rank and file, having a real say in what kind of party we want, that by that rank and file power, we can democratically decide this is the kind of campaign we want to run, this is the kind of candidate we want to have, and we are going to, within the party, choose democratically choose candidates who are up for that job, and if they, do, if they prove deficient, then we, you know, I, I'm, we are not against the idea of recall. We're just pointing out that in this case, the recall is by big business against working people. But yeah. working people absolutely should have the right to recall representatives who have failed them because that is what the system does. Ultimately, the reason Bernie Sanders was in the Oval Office, you know, in that photo op or whatever, I don't genuinely don't believe that 
It's because he wants to aggrandize himself. But it is because people like him believe that this is the best you can do. This is the right. best you can do. This you can't have overthrow capitalism. You can't. You you have to make changes uh, on on the on the periphery. Well, we don't agree with that, and we don't believe that the times call for call for minimal changes. The time call for dramatic and courageous action, and that cannot come from personalized politics. It can only come from mass action, where masses of people have the democratic say in what happens. Yeah, and. Uh, to your point about mass action, labor action, I'm old enough to remember a point earlier this year where a lot of folks on the left were being really enthusiastic about the fact that Joe Manchin supported the For the People, People Act. And I, re I seem to remember that the reason that Joe, Joe Manchin did at least articulate support for it, which of course, like everything else, is going nowhere absent um, filibuster reform, uh, was that the United Mine workers union came out in support of it and he couldn't cross them because they're too important to a state in West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. In fact, this is very similar to uh, what we were calling for uh, during the force the vote debate uh, that we said that uh, the, the squad needs to actually demand, you know, take on the force the vote battle. Uh, but in addition to that, in addition to taking a firm stand in Congress and using their numerical balance of power, that they should specifically call for mass rallies of the working class in West Virginia and Arizona. And, you know, at that time I was also saying Georgia because that was also the time, remember, when two uh, senators, Democratic senators, were going to be elected. And, and Biden, uh, you know, famously said, well, just elect these Democrats and, we, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to win 15. Well, where are all those promises, you know? Right. So that is the power of mass action. And as long as you, you as an elected representative, whether you're in Congress or you're in the union hall, if you, as long as you refuse to mobilize the rank and file, unionized or non-unionized, you are ultimately caving in to the establishment because you're not actually presenting a threat. By yourself, you are not a threat. If you mobilize tens of thousands of you know uh, people in West Virginia who badly want $15 an hour, absolutely that will put pressure on Joe Manchin and and you 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 made the point yeah yeah all right let's let's hear what ASC has to say in this clip I wanted to ask you um obviously we're getting to crunch time um there is some reporting tonight that the senate may have agreed amongst themselves that they will avert a government shutdown tomorrow night so that may take some of that immediate pressure on but we're still obviously looking at this string of hurdles in terms of passing the president's um big three and a half trillion dollar plan. Is there a different conversation happening inside the Progressive Caucus than is happening inside the Democratic Party Caucus as a whole? I know the whole Democratic Caucus meets now and the Progressive Caucus meets amongst themselves. Are those conversations materially different? You know, I think the conversations that happen within the Progressive Caucus are very focused in how do we expand child care, health care, climate action and restore power to working class people in the United States of America. That is what we talk about every day, all the time, from week to week. And, you know, there may be some differences between the Progressive Caucus and the overall caucus. Uh, in in some of those centers of conversation. But I would say that we have been laser focused on this agenda and delivering for working class families across the country all year. And um, that does not change. <laughs> it's really just a, a discussion of how do we best do that in a way that most people mm -hmm. can feel in their everyday lives. That to me was Rachel Maddow teeing up an important contrast between what motivates ostensibly the Progressive Caucus as, as opposed to the, shall we say, corporate Dems, the corporate caucus of, Demo of the Democratic Party. And while AOC is willing to say that the Progressive Caucus is focused on working people's needs, she didn't quite do the thing where she says the rest of the Democrats have different motives, largely of a corporate capture nature. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was... <laughs> That was, uh, I had not heard that. It, it is uh, pretty stunning, I have to say. These these are comments that basically give cover to the Democratic Party as a whole, which has, which is controlled by an establishment which is thoroughly, thoroughly tied to corporate interests. And look at the difference between uh, this statement that we just heard from AOC and 
the um, absolute ferocity with which Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema, and they're just the two most prominent faces, the other people, as you said, of the corporate caucus of the Democratic Party. Right. Um, if such a thing does not exist, then it should formally exist, and it will be probably <laughs> a big chunk. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is a majority, but it will be a huge chunk of the Democratic right. Party. Uh, but look at the ferocity with which they represent the interests that they nakedly represent. You know, they represent big business interests. They are they are unapologetic about it, and they fight to the end. Uh, that's what. So if you contrast that to this. It's completely different where you have the progressive Democrats saying, well, we are all one party. We're just, they're just, these are just differences in how best to achieve it. That completely uh, blurs what the actual debate is, which is that you have a thoroughly corporate, par in corporate ruled party that is unable to deliver what working class people need. And it, again, it poses the question of, you know, what, what, is, what kind of political organization working people actually need. Yeah, I, 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 I do. I want to give credit on some level to the fact that we are having a, a much more robust conversation about the influence of corporatists in this moment because they are holding the line or forcing the vote or everyone to call it right. There is a conversation that's being had in Arizona about Kirsten Cinema having these private meetings with these industry groups, et cetera, instead of being in Congress trying to figure it out. There, there are these conversations about Joe Manchin and his daughter and prescription drug prices and the various pressures and influences that are driving his decision making, right? Like, the, the, and his links to, um, you know, the, the energy sector and all of those kinds of things. And I think that is proof positive that forcing the vote, as it were, is not mm -hmm. a one-off to the people who want us to stop talking about it. It's never, it was never about a one-off. It's a political strategy that exposes the gap between what elected officials are willing to do and fight for and what the people that elected them want and exposes the true motives of politicians, elected, elected officials who aren't actually fighting for what their constituents overwhelmingly want, right? So that that is happening. And I don't expect every time that one of the squad members gets on TV, they're necessarily going to, you know, burn it all down and every appearance is going to be the most combative, combative appearance in the world. But it does strike me as a significant problem <laughs> that progressives are unwilling to be antagonistic, openly kind of fight <laughs> their colleagues, which is, you know, I don't well, even want to use that word. That's where the problem lies. That's where the problem lies. If you, if you think of them as colleagues and friends, then you are in some shape or form, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say selling out, but yeah, but that's what it comes down to in the sense that, uh, you know, I, I, under, I, uh, uh, I think that it's absolutely correct to have, to be serious about strategy and tactics, and that includes what formulations you use when you speak at a given moment. And of course, it wouldn't make sense for the elected representatives on the side of working people to be to have to be sledgehammerish in any way, you know, where they don't understand what's called for at a given moment. But I do think that at no point uh, should and I and I take this very seriously, should you further illusions in the democratic establishment. And statements like the ones we just heard do exactly that. And that is one of the issues as well it, with being part of the Democratic Party. You cannot, um, you cannot be a member of that party and then be expected to be at war with the party every single day, at least without mm. your own real forces. I mean, yes, there will be times when there will be debates inside parties themselves. But I think, again, once again, it illustrates the fundamental nature of the Democratic Party and why it's a non-starter. That doesn't mean that there aren't good people in the Democratic Party, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, elected officials. The point is that ultimately, this is what you, this is the agenda, this is the uh, line you have to tow. And we don't believe that towing that line is in the interests of working people. Again, it's this is not about a moralistic debate about uh, an individual. It's about what is actually going to further the agenda for working people at this crucial time. And I don't think you can do that by furthering illusions in the Democratic Party. I think that's very important. But I do agree with you that uh, the fact that cinema and mansion are being much more exposed now than they were before is certainly testament to the pressure 
the progressive caucus themselves are feeling to have taken a stand and that and that's actually a positive thing yeah i, I remember it makes me think that um my family was involved in a, in a legal action at one point, and I remember we went to court, and the at, during a break, the opposing counsel, you know, came together and were you know chatting and very friendly. And my mother was like, "What's what's going on? Like they're <laughs> they're the enemy. This was you know you know a case involving you know a, a tort that was very serious and was very emotionally gripping, and we were very invested in." And to see the people who are supposed to be your, you know, forceful advocates having such a friendly relationship with the people who are trying to strip you of some really important rights, it it, it kind of blew, blew mother's mind. And once I became a lawyer and I could have understood how this works and how we all went to the same law schools and how we all <laughs> do really know each other, you know, I, I was able to kind of explain it to her, but it didn't make it feel any less wrong. It didn't make it feel like there it, somehow the in, the necessary investment to be a truly zealous advocate wasn't compromised in part by the fact that people's allegiances were kind of blurred well, and, in yeah, this and, way. Yeah. And in fact, and in, and in I mean, first of all, yeah, I just want to acknowledge yeah, yeah I think your mother's uh, feeling of uh, being just weirded out at the very least, or maybe even horrified to see <laughs> that. I, I Totally identify with that, um, even at a personal level. Uh, but I think, again, th that goes to your earlier point about if you are genuinely uh, pushing for uh, the interests of working people, then the, these uh, Democrats uh, who are upholding corporate interests are not going to want to come and be pleasant to you. That's it's as you will, you, as they that. won't. You won't want to help them down the steps of the Capitol. They, 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 they're not going. <laughs> I mean, that, and that's the thing. I mean. Uh, you know, a lot of times people will, uh, the, especially the the criticisms from corporate media towards me personally, you know, will will talk about how I, I antagonize Democrats on the council. But in reality, what's going on is that I am never personal to them. I am never disrespectful th to them in any way. As a matter of fact, as I said, my own opinion decidedly is that I am far, far more polite and co cordial and gracious to them than they ever are to me. But the point is the reason they act the way they do towards me, deeply hostile and antagonistic, is precisely because I am not there to earn popularity points. I am there to fight. But then when you fight, they don't like it. So it's not about, you know, you going there tr trying to, you know, it's, I don't like, I don't wake up every day thinking, okay, today what am I going to do so that uh, Democrats won't like me? No, I get up every day thinking, today what are we going to do in order to make sure that we a fight to the best of our abilities for working people. That makes an enemy out of you in the eyes of those who are either openly corporate or those who are performatively progressive but ultimately know which side their bread is buttered on and they don't really want to make enemies out of big business and Amazon or whatever. So they are not going to want to be cordial to you precisely because they know where the battle lines are drawn, but it's because of the stands you took that it became clear where the battle lines are drawn. So if, if so that's why I, I often say jokingly, but not quite jokingly, is that when, when the establishment figures start being nice to me, that's the day I'll know I am doing something grievously wrong. <laughs> well, that day is not today. And so uh, as we wrap up, can you tell our listeners how they can support you in um, beating this recall effort? So one, first of all, just I would urge everybody who is watching this, if even if this is not the first time you've heard about it, but especially if you've, the first time you've heard about it, it doesn't matter where you are in the United States or internationally, please understand that this is something that the left and the progressives as a whole have stake in defeating. We all have a stake together in defeating the recall. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that this is about an individual or just one city. This is about what message the ruling class of uh, America, of Seattle, is able to send if they are able to win this recall against us. You know, the message will be, let's try to start to overturn the progressive victories we have won, uh, and let's send a message, chilling message to protest movements, future protest movements. So this battle is very, very serious for all of us, and I urge you all 
to go to shamasolidarity.org, my first name, solidarity.org, to, um, may, first of all, if you're um, an American citizen or you have a green card, you please make a donation. If you already donated, see if you can max out your donation because, you know, obviously uh, the corporate landlords are not donating to our campaign. We rely on working class donations from people, like-minded people who believe that this is important. And last but not least, no matter which city you are in, 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 in the world, if progressive leaders, especially labor leaders, don't know about this, please share this information with them. And we want public endorsements and support from labor and progressive leaders from all over the world. All right. Well, thank you for that, Shama. I, I should ask also, I mean, how you're feeling about the expected outcomes of, of, the, of the vote. Do you have a sense of, you know, any polling information or kind of responses from knocking doors or, or what have you? I mean, what, what do you think the odds of the recall effort being successful are? Well, obviously, as I said, we have to be sober. They have done everything in their power to uh, refuse the most democratic possible election, which is the November election. And so in that sense, we have to take our challenge seriously. I don't have a uh, statistical polls uh, from which we could uh, glean something. What I can say is that it's very clear that our on-the-ground door-knocking and tabling effort is central. It's the backbone of winning this campaign against the recall because it is, uh, you know, precisely, the recall relies precisely on people not having information because people are busy, you know, trying to pay their rent, trying to make sure they don't get more into debt after this COVID crisis, which still hasn't ended. The Delta variant is still causing uh, so many problems for people. Uh, so given all that, uh, they are not tuned to every detail of what's happening. So it's our job to let them know that this recall is going to be bad for their lives and they should vote no. And so the uh, the door knocking and tabling campaign is the backbone of our of our effort. And so that's why actually, uh, thank, thank you for reminding me, if you're watching this and you can come out to Seattle for a few weeks, heading into December 7th and help us with our um, uh, get out the vote effort, we really need your help. And uh, I know we can win this campaign, but we can't win without the maximum possible support from everybody who understands that this is uh, something at stake for them. Thank you for that, Shama. Good luck to you. Um, thank you for taking the time to inform our reader at our readers, L LOL. Thank you for taking the time to inform our listeners and to our listeners, as always, keep the faith. Thank you so much, Brianna. Really appreciate it. Hey, YouTube, don't forget this is a podcast. To get full episodes, including ones that are behind a paywall, go to patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. To get more episodes, please do subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and like this video.